we have not thought of before, that we will see things we have not seen before, and that then through that we'll be able to see you at work in ways that we have never saw before, seen before. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Parables. Did y'all do your readings on this? Yes. Most of you did? I'm glad. This, uh, who said that? Is that you, Chauncey? It was not. It was, it was me and right there. That guy. I'm not going to lie in church. No, well, I try not to in church. We get started tonight on the parable of the um, Pharisees and the tax collector. It's a great story. Um, I was in a youth group years ago that did a drama of this during Youth Sunday is the message. And they were really good. I was not one of them. Um, my sister was. She was. She was the tax collector. Fit her to the T. <laughs> the passage of scripture is very descriptive of uh, what we need to learn, and I've been trying to to stress. I can't stress it enough. Anywhere I go, and we forget. And that is, look at the context in which we read a passage of scripture. Without the context. We take the scripture and we misuse it in horrible ways. I want to give you an example of this. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians, there's that famous scripture that has been thrown in my face so many times about um, women, cover your head from your church. Women don't speak in church. But they leave off the really important part, which just prior to that, it says, when you preach and pray, cover your heads. You go, what? Wait, that doesn't say don't preach. It says when you preach and pray. That says women are preaching. What does this mean? So nobody would tell me because they didn't know. So I had to go to seminary to find out. <laughs> no, I was going to go anyway. I didn't, I didn't mind. But here's, here's what you find out about context. Corinth was a sin city. And one of the great temples to whoever the sex goddess was, was it a thing? Do you remember, Derek? Is it not what you can look at? I don't pay attention. <laughs> well, it turns out the church, the um, temple was funded by temple prostitutes. They went out and they shared themselves with all the population, and it was kind of like a sin city, and people came from all over to go to Corinth and play there and mess around and whatever. And that's how they funded the temple and whatever they did. And what about these um, women who were being prostitutes for their goddess? Um, one of the things you could tell, you could recognize them, because they wore their head, their hair down and exposed. So, women, as Christians in the early church, is still learning what it is to even be Christian, kind of like us, I think, um, cover your heads. So you will not be associated with the stuff going on for the goddess. It was a real lesson. And I cannot tell you the number of preachers who are afraid to even mention that passage, especially in the Presbyterian church. So I had to make a point, and I don't know, come on my head. I don't like hats, even though I look good in them, you know. Why did we wear hats as little girls and back in the 60s and 50s and 40s? You wore hats because we were supposed to cover our heads in church. That's what it boils down to. It became a fashion show, but you know, it's all right. I wore really cute, and I wore gloves too. We covered up, we covered up. So, look at context, or you might miss the whole point. So I want you to think about that when you're reading these parables, that you consider where they are, of who's there, who are the main characters of the crowd? Who are the main characters in the parable? And then the questions that Hamilton asks is to say, um, what was Hamilton going to say? You remember? You don't know, do you? He never knows where I'm going. Half the time I don't either. Or where was he going with that? You don't remember? Or no? Any clues? Were y'all listening? Context. <laughs> Context. Context, that's right. Keep going. Oh, yes, and the questions are, thank you, gosh, a lot of people who are pathetic to even answer my questions. Um, again, <laughs> I'm tired. Y'all been doing Bible studies all day. I'm confused. Am I in the Old Testament or the New 
Is that sort of like a... Come on, that's one, okay? We'll come back to me. This is important. Oh, look at the characters and who's present. Who are you in the crowd? Are you part of the poor? Are you a Pharisee? In what way? Who are you in the parable? Like, for instance, the prodigal son, which we are going to consider tonight. Um, are you the elder son? Are you the prodigal? Which means <coughs> basically a cruddy person. Um, are you the father? And what's the context? And what does that context mean and say about how unfair um, life is? Ooh. What's the good news? All those things have to be considered to be able to come across what it is. Now, there's something I wanted to say before we look at the video. Oh, yes. Regarding the parables themselves. And he may mention this. I have not seen the video, but it's only about 12 minutes of our time together. Um, the synoptic gospels. Synoptic means similar. By, um, Gospels and Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you were to read them, you have the stories that go through all three, or only unique to some. And John is a different bird altogether in terms of his approach to Scripture. It's the last of the Gospels. So, I found this interesting. You might want to put it in your New Testament section of your Bible. Um, nine of the parables are in all three Gospels, and we can imagine what those three things are. Two are, appear only in Mark's Gospel, which is the earliest of the Gospels. Eight appear in Matthew only. An example of that's not even a parable. Sixteen appear um, only in Luke. So that he, Luke has most and really calls us to task with those parables. And so we're going to stop with that and watch um, Hamilton's brief video and then we'll get back into it. Can you do that or do I have to do it? You're doing it? Do you have to go? of the gospel, of course, is lifting up the lowly. 
In Jesus' parables in Luke's gospel, we find that theme almost every, in almost every one of those parables. And so 49 parables, of those parables, two are unique to Mark. They don't appear in any other gospel. Eight are unique to Matthew. They don't appear in any other gospel. Sixteen, however, are unique to Luke. So there's a lot of parables that Luke has that nobody else is teaching about. And so you want to see what's different about Luke's parables from Matthew and Mark's gospel. And I want us to start with Luke chapter 18, verses 9 and 12. Jesus told the parable to certain people who had convinced themselves that they were righteous and who looked on everyone else with disgust. Last year, 2021, for the first time, the number of people in America who claim to not have an affiliation with any religious organization uh, went over 50%. Ask the people who don't go to church anymore if they believe in God, and many of those people say, well, yeah, I believe in God, and I try to be a good person. Then why not a part of a synagogue or a church? And the number one answer is because the people there treated me poorly, or they seem to me to be religious hypocrites. Now, the truth is we're all hypocrites. And what I found is that non-religious people are not upset that they're, that people in the church are hypocrites, because they know they're hypocrites too. They don't always live up to their values. It's when religious people don't realize that they're hypocrites. When they start pointing the finger at other people and looking down on them, as opposed to recognizing that maybe I need to look at myself first. This parable is about people who couldn't see the sin in themselves, but they pointed it out, and other people looked at them with disgust. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself with these words, God, I thank you that I am not like everyone else, crooks, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I get a tenth of everything I receive. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to look towards heaven. Rather, he struck his chest and said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. I tell you, this person went down to his home justified rather than a Pharisee. And then he makes the point, here's the summary. All who lift themselves up will be brought low. And those who make themselves low will be lifted up. We've learned from Mary's lips that what God is like is he lifts up the lowly. But here, this Pharisee is lifting himself up. And what we find is that the, the tax collector who is brought down, God wants to lift up. And so our task isn't to lift ourselves up. It's to lower ourselves so that we can lift other people up. And when we are brought low ourselves, to remember that Jesus wants to lift us up. So when I think about this parable, and you know, we've got the Pharisee, or we've got the tax collector, the question is, which one are you more like? And you know, what we want to be is, well, I'm, I'm the religious person. I'm a faithful Christian. I tithe. I do all these things. And that's all awesome. But somewhere inside all of us, there's just a bit of the Pharisee. And I've often said to people, you know, I, I think I'm a recovering Pharisee who sometimes falls off the wagon. And I find myself going back to judging other people, looking down at people because they think differently or they are different or they're in a different place in life. And, uh, and if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, I have to own that and recognize it and then work to say, Jesus, help me to be more like you. Help me to lift up the lowly and to lower myself. And I love how scripture teaches those who humble themselves will be exalted. But those who exalt themselves will be brought low. And so that's what we find in this parable. The other picture is this, uh, is this tax collector who recognizes that he's alienated from God. He feels far away from God. And you know, I find there's a lot of people who feel that way in life, that they feel ashamed or far away from God or like they've really blown it in life. And what this parable is teaching is by the, fair, by the tax collector going away justified, it's giving hope to all of those people out there who feel shame or guilt or pain or far from God. And so when we read this parable, we're being asked, which are we going to be like? The Pharisee or the tax collector? It's just a really simple parable, but it captures the theme of this entire gospel. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15. So Luke 15, I love this chapter. It's the parable of the lost things. So Luke 15, 1, all the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around Jesus to listen to him. The tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus like moths to a flame. They couldn't resist him. He was irresistible in his love for them. They were gathered on the list of Jesus. And then verse 2, the Pharisees and legal experts were grumbling, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, he tells a parable, first of all, about a, uh, about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one of them wandered away, and did he not leave the 99 behind to go find that one lost sheep? And he's describing his mission like he came to be that shepherd who was finding the lost sheep who wandered away and trying to bring them back. And then the next parable is about a woman who lost a coin. And she had 10 valuable coins. She lost one of them. It probably was a day's wages. And then she turned her house upside down, high and low, searched everywhere to find that one coin. And he's saying, in essence, this is what God is like. God is like this woman who turns the house upside down to find that one lost coin. And you are that one lost coin. But then if you get to the very next parable, and this starts in verse 11. Jesus says, a certain man had two sons. 
The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them, and soon afterward the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth on extravagant living. I love that Jesus is telling this parable with, you know, surrounded by a crowd of non-religious people. But on the outskirts of that crowd, kind of looking down their nose, I picture them standing on a ledge looking down at all these creepy sinners who are here. And, and these people are out there and they're like, okay, the father had two sons. One of them was the good guy, one of them was the bad guy, and we're the good brother. And these are the ones that are asked for their father's inheritance and took it away. So Jesus continues to tell this parable to both types of people. And, uh, and as he does, he says, the boy went off to a far off country and he squandered all his wealth on, uh, on you know, crazy living. There was a famine that came to the land and suddenly nobody's his friends and he needs to get a job, and he ends up slopping pigs. And if, if you're a Jew in the first century, there's no lower job than working with swine, because swine are unclean animals. You're not allowed to eat it, you don't want to touch it. And Jesus is trying to say, this guy's got as low as it goes, the bottom of the barrel is. And, uh, and then he has a wake, and he says, you know, I wonder if I went back to my dad, if he would take me, to, take me back, not as his son, but as his servant. So he makes his journey, you know, comes you know, back to his father's property, and Jesus says, while the boy was still far way off, his father saw him. I picture his dad every day looking to the end of the field where his, dad, where his son left, hoping his son wasn't dead, hoping he'd come back. And when his father saw him, Jesus says he ran across the field, he ran to him. And he wrapped his arms around his son. He didn't chastise him, he wasn't, he wasn't angry towards him, he wrapped his arms around his son. And then he called the servants, please come bring a cloak for his back and a ring for his finger and shoes for his feet and go slaughter the fatted calf so we can have a party because my son who was dead is alive again. And here's what Jesus is saying to that crowd of sinners around, not religious and not only religious people. That's what God is like. That is what God is like. And so the boy comes home and he's welcomed back as a child, and he was a son of the, of the father. And then the older brother is off working in the fields. And he comes home. And he hears the sound of the music playing in the house and the party that's going on. And the older brother says, what, what's going on? And the servant said, your, your, your brother who left, he came back, and your dad's throwing a party and celebrating. And how's the older brother feel? He's really ticked off. Like, you got to be kidding me. And the father comes out to find his, you know, his oldest son. And his oldest son said, you know, you've never thrown a party for me. You've never done it. You never gave me these things. I'm, like, I've been here faithful to you this whole time. And you didn't do anything to help me. And the, and the father says, son, everything I have belongs to you. Like, you've always been faithful, and I, you know, I love you. And your brother was lost, and he came back, and I have to rejoice at that. And so it's interesting, Jesus doesn't condemn the Pharisees in this. He just says, look, you're still the father's children too, but you've forgotten how important it is to find the lost and bring them back home. And that's true for a lot of religious people. There's a lot of religious people out there who forget that Jesus' primary passion, and he's going to say it in Luke 19, verse, uh, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. Or as Mary said, he came to lift up the lowly. He came to bring people back to God like, like the prodigal who was watered away. And when the church forgets that, then we're not only a church. And there's a whole, lot of, a whole lot of Christian communities, I think, that are really doing a lot of great things. And they're focused on, you know, they're focused on being close to Jesus and being better disciples and you know, reading the Bible and caring for each other in the church, but they forgot that Jesus came not just for them, but for all the people outside the church to find ways to welcome them home. And that's part of our task. When we look at churches dying, we look at you know people no longer going to church, part of it is what have we done to be like Jesus? Or have we been more like the Pharisees? And when we're like Jesus, we find people are drawn to that kind of love. So you'll have a chance in, in your reading the book to study a couple of other parables. But in the parables, Jesus is teaching us who we're meant to be like, what we're not meant to be like, and who God our Father is. And then he's calling us to follow in his footsteps and lifting up the lowly. Let's pray again. God, we thank you so much for your love and kindness and for your forgiveness when we've been jerks to other people, when we've been the, the tax collector who thought he was all that. Forgive us when we've been the older brother who was resentful of the younger brother who was a sinner and came back home. Please help us to love the people you love, to see them the way you see them, to pay attention. Help us in this, we pray in Jesus' name, in your holy name. Amen.
Um, just to remember, we, he used stories because people could really uh, affiliate with those stories. And I know if we were to ask you all, what are your favorite Bible stories um, or parables, to then say, why, why? And examine it even more because when stories resonate with us, it brings us into a closer relationship with those who are around us and especially with God. If it comes, the story is from Jesus, especially. And, <clears throat> um, but with these parables, which ones really resonated to you, the ones we read, or did they all kind of slap you out of the head? Just to hear him describe it in context really is amazing. Um, one of the things, the parable that really affected me the most is because I've seen it in action. Um, the prodigal son, which is one of the favorites, we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan next time, and is also unique to Luke's gospel. But the prodigal son, I'm wondering if we could look at it not just as a son who fled and came back, was restored, but the other son who was there and had everything. But was he really connected to his family? I don't know, that resentment stuff can really kill relationships, it really can. Um, he was there all the time, but talking about inheritance, in that era, that context, um, the older son got everything that his father had because they were the ones who were going to be responsible for the welfare of the family to the generations yet to come. And for his brother to say, give me my share of the inheritance, his share was literally nothing except what the father decided to be gracious about. And it usually meant that he'd have a place to raise his family and work and make a living and not starve to death. So you have the older son who resented staying there, who despised his brother, who despised his father, all of these things. And yet the hard heart that never was restored fully to his father as far as we know, um, he was a prodigal in his own way. And I think all of us are that way a little bit. Um, I was a prodigal once. I wasn't abused in any way, shape, or form. I didn't ask for money that I had earned myself. I just announced to my parents, look, I need to see the world. But when I was 16, I saved my money for three years on a plan. I know, if you want to run away from home, do it now. But no, I wanted to make sure I was decent and work. And I went back to tell my parents that I was leaving the country. I don't run away halfway. I'm going to go to the other side of the world. <laughs> like a prodigal did. And they said, well, you got to have a, a ticket to go. I said, not only do I have a ticket to fly, I have an open-ended ticket to come back eventually. So know that I am planning on coming back. Well, when are you going to do that? Well, I don't know. I was 16. Where are you going to go? I'm going to Scotland. And I did some investigation, and there's a manor house out in the middle of beautiful Scotland land near Bentley Stone is the name of it. And they have all these international students who come every summer, and we're going to work on the estate, and it's going to be wonderful. Well, you need a passport, and I pulled it out of my back pocket. I had located my, my birth certificate, I, and that's when you needed shots to leave the country. I had a, a, my, my shot card that said I was, I was healthy, and, and they took me to the airport and put me on the plane. They were smart to do that. I was stupid to go. Now, it was abusive. It was hard labor. There were no other international students who'd come to work the estate that summer. Um, the lord and the lady of the manor were cruel people. They were cruel. Um, and, and I just put up with it. Until I saw how they treated someone who was just visiting, coming back. She was on her way back to Maryland. I forget her name now. But um, they treated her like trash and publicly and so around the table at tea time. And so I was sitting there watching them, and I said, that's how I'm being treated. I think I'm out of here. But I had to have a plan. I had saved about 10 pounds, 
And at that point, back in the early 70s, you could do a lot on nothing. So I, I got a book called Five to Ten Dollars a Day in Europe. And it had a whole list of places and hostels you could go and stay. I mean, I was going to try to get the best out of it I could. I was 16. And I went to some of the most remarkable places on an old B-52 uh, bomber that they had ripped out and had the seats down the side for it. It was just ridiculous. Okay, and, went, and went to Switzerland. And I did not make this stuff up, y'all. <laughs> went to Switzerland, got on a bus, booked an old tourist, and took off. Made my way to Paris. I knew exactly where I was going. And the one thing that I began to see even before I came back to the States was how God took care of me. When we got to Paris, I had the address of the hostel I was going to stay at. And I went, it was rush hour in, in, in the metro system, and I was looking at this big map of Paris, and this little French man came up to us, and I was, I was with a friend at this point, and he said, oh, you're Americans, right? So, yeah, yeah, how'd you know? And so he said, here's where you need to go. You get on the metro here, and you go to there, and it was in French accent, it was, it was just precious little lamb. And then you get here, and you go to that metro, and then you cross the, the Thames, and then uh, go up that hill, right out of the metro, and, and you'll find your hostel there. Oh, good on. Thank you. Thank you. So he did what he was saying, and all the way, I said to my friend, how did, how did he know where we were going? Angels aware. God was looking after, after me. And at that time, I thought about the prodigal son, the daughter in this case. And I said, God was with that guy when he was in the big style. Didn't have money, didn't have anything, except an open ended ticket that I managed to get on the plane and fly home. It took me a few years to recover from that experience, but we had a <coughs> when I got home. And it was just so funny. I was in control, but not really. So I, I am associated with the prodigal son, except I was nicer than he was. He was just a mess, but I was scared of being a mess. So we, we all get lost. But here's a key word that I think had to have resonated with everybody who was there, both Pharisees and those who um, found themselves lost. Man, I'm tired. I'm just not sticking right now. Um, um, the Father, who in this case I would say represents God, the Father, who had compassion. The word is used in the scripture. I learned a long time ago that when you're reading a story in the Gospels and it says that Jesus had compassion, or the Father had compassion, <coughs> pay attention, because it means that something amazing is about to happen. To give you another example of that, the bottom, well, Jesus was um, on the hillside, and the disciples looked out over the countryside and said, oh man, look at those people coming. And man, how are we going to feed them? It's getting late, and we should just tell them to go home and get their own food. That's what we should do. And so who, we don't have any food. We don't have any. And Jesus winks. I know he does. He looks at the people coming, and the, the words that he says are, he had compassion for them. And that's when the story of the lack of food came up. And he said, well, find some, you feed them, you feed them. Can you imagine 5,000 people showing up and, and Jesus says, you, you take care of them, you feed them. All I know is in a church when food, the food just doesn't run out. Not when it's been blessed by God. And Jesus had to have been laughing when he was dividing the bread and the fish and handed it out to the disciples. Just, he had compassion. And the hungry were fed. Have they ever been hungry and being fed by the, by the Holy Spirit of God? I have. It shows up. <laughs> Literally, but also spiritually. So we have the Father in the prodigal son who had compassion 
compassion from afar off, always looking for us, always welcoming us, always having a party for us. I just, I just think it's a remarkable story for the older brother and the younger brother and for the father whose son had come home. I mean, anybody who has ever lost a child, they run, and we had a daughter who did that. Well, she could run too, but she didn't go to Scotland. She went five, five houses down the street from us. <laughs> she thought she was really being powerful. But <clears throat> we pretended she did. So I, I, I wonder, who are we? Are we the father? I'd like to say sometimes, with our children, and even with our grandchildren. Have to be careful on that one if their mother's in the same room, but still. And then, um, are you the elder brother? I always have wondered, what, what kind of relationship did the older brother and the prodigal brother have after he came home? I wonder about that. Um, but we don't know. Are you the prodigal? Every story in the scripture asks us that question. Otherwise, we wouldn't be interested in it. We're drawn to them. I, I love the Baptist words they use. Can I get a witness? Y'all ever heard that? Mm -hmm. I go to the Bible and you can hear the stories. They're testimonies. Stand, give your testimony, sister or brother. You better believe it. What is your story? What is your testimony? I've heard many testimonies in the Presbyterian Church, and most of them are as dull as dry wood. <laughs> Especially when it comes to finance. Now, our finance people here, I believe, are. Please don't get up and do a minute for mission for giving, and then all of a sudden everybody's asleep. And going, when's he going to sit? Don't read us numbers. Tell us why we shouldn't. What is it about the Lord we follow that, that we have to be dumb? Tell the story of how your life has been transformed because of the presence of Christ in your life. Sometimes when you didn't even know he was there. I get chilly on the I'm preaching now. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll do this in, in the fall. But the prodigal really struck me. Now, the last parable that is in this chapter has to do with um, the rich man and Lazarus. And people say, oh, well, that rich man, he was really bad, bad. bad. And then here Jesus' response to it, when he goes to hell, he tells a story. And I just love it. The, the rich man down in hell asking Lazarus to get him some water? What? This is the man who... I mean, Jesus' description about the poor man at the gate, oh my goodness, it's gross, it's awful, and he communicates how awful it was to people who walked by him. And the rich man avoided him. Didn't speak to him as far as we know, knew his name. And what does Lazarus mean? We learned this a couple weeks ago. God helps. Well, during his life, it didn't seem like it, did it? It did not. So the rich man didn't apologize for being rich, nor should he have. But it was what he didn't do. That is the reason he went to hell. I know rich men. I know them. And I want to tell you a story about it. I want to give you a testimony. This was a testimony that was given by a friend of mine. It was, it's called, his name is Bob Bear. And Bob was in the Tampa church. I was an elder in that church. And we were putting together a, a mission trip to Honduras. We had a, a mission relationship with the Presbyterian Church in Honduras. And um, our son was going to go, uh, our daughter was going to go, and Bob was going to go. And it was about 50-50 youth and adults. And they were going down to build a uh, school slash church, multi-purpose building, of course. And this village way up in the mountains of Honduras <laughs> Um, and it was an incredible trip. But Bob shared this story with us, and he, he was one of the, the guides of the, the trip, helped put it together. And it was going to be a week long, 
and he told his boss that he wanted the week so he could go on a mission trip. And his boss said, well, this is going to uh, work against you. I mean, this is not going to be uh, work time. This will be your vacation time. And he said, yeah, I know. And you're going to go to Honduras and work in a dirty village with poor people. He said, yeah, we're going to build a school. And uh, we're going to help the women learn how to sew. And they'll be able to make uniforms for their children because it's a requirement in the country. And he said, using your own money. And he said, yeah, I got lots of money. <laughs> this is going to be great. And how many people are going from here to church? Oh, about 20. And I wrote it down so I could um, get it right. This was his boss. I thought it was a co-worker, but Derek corrected me. He said, no, it was his boss. Why are you going to spend a week of your hard-earned vacation time to go to a third world country to help the poor? God put them in that condition for some sin or other. To go to help them would be going against God's will for them. God means for them to be poor. God means for me to be rich. Why throw away the gift of money that God has given me to help the poor who was supposed to be poor in the first place? And the answer to that is, don't help. And he went about to, and he ridiculed our friend and our church for doing this. That is the rich man's justification for doing nothing. Now, are we the rich men? Or are we the Bob Bears? I am sometimes the rich man. In the Brandon, we were in kind of an inner city, depressed area of the city. And it was considered the armpit of Brandon. Very poor area. And, um, where was I going with that? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was a rich man. Yes. The poor would come to the door of the church. And the previous um, folks, before I got there, would turn them away. And said, go away. You can go to this agency. The Methodist to be on the street, you can go there if you want to. Um, they might have something for you. There was no um, compassion, thank you, none at all. And so we're there, and they would be on the, the street corners. And, and we have this in every place, and Raleigh is everywhere, where you go by and they have their signs that say, you know, I'm a veteran, I have no food. I don't know. And I have heard it said, well, they're there. They don't, they don't need that money. They're just going to go and they're going to use it to get drunk on it, buy your cheap, cheap liquor, and, and they're just, they're not, you don't give your money away to them. That's a rich man's response. And there was one on the edge of the, it's the longest light in the whole county, I'm sure. It was a three and a half minute light. And it just drove me nuts. And I, and I always was fussed about it. And there was a man, I'd seen him before, he'd come by the church, and he um, had his sign up, and the children were in the car with him. And I said, Mom, who is that? I said, well, that's Harry. <laughs> his name's Harry. And I said, no. And he's, he really is, he's just looking for help. What are they going to do with money? I said, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he's doing anything with it that I know of. Do you give him money? And I said, no, I don't. And my mind was thinking, he's just going to spend it on liquor, and he's already an addict, and so don't, I don't want to hurt him anymore. Yeah, right, that was what I said. And they said, well, if he doesn't have anything, we, we should give him something. I said, what do you think we should give him? We should give him at least some water, Mama. It's hot. And it just so happens our son had an unopened bottle. So we were parked there, he rolled down his window, and he said, Mr. Harry, I've got something for you. And he came over, and, and he, he was in a bad way, and he said, have my water, it's hot. And he gave it to me. We came by that place.
place all the time. I never go anywhere to this day without a water bottle in my car to hand to those folks who are on the edge. They would make peanut butter sandwiches when they were making their lunches from school. And we would put it in a separate bag and they said, this one's for Harry. I'm going, wow, I'm a Pharisee, a rich woman. <laughs> Except I didn't call myself a woman. How could I not see like our children can see? We also know in the time of Jesus, children were worth nothing. And he was the one who said, let them come to me. Wow. I really don't want to say anything else. Except I love his comparison of the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel and the Beatitudes in Luke's Gospel, which are much simplified, but the spiritual aspect was not covered up with righteousness words. You know, like Matthew's, it was made up of basic words. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are not, are you hungry for righteousness? No. Are you just hungry? And I love the comparison. You look at Matthew's gospel and the birth story. They're only in Matthew and Luke. But they are very different stories. In Matthew's gospel, the birth story happens, um, they go into a house, the wise men. They are rich men who come searching for a king. And you have Luke's gospel, and they were shepherds. When they are called lowly shepherds, they were considered trash people who would take care of the livestock. We, we studied that in the women's Bible study, that the shepherds, the herdsmen, were considered dirty, foul people. And you don't have anything to do with them. And yet they recognized who Jesus was right away. The wise guys, they were, they were good too. They, um, they listened to their dreams and went back another way. Not just in terms of direction. I think they went back because they've been touched by God and this child and did not want to endanger him. So those are just my two takes on um, Matthew's account of some of the things and Luke's account. Luke will always go to the lonely. And uh, that teaches us a lot. I also know that in Luke's gospel, or any of the gospels, Jesus never turned anybody away. Now people turned away from him. I think about the ten lepers um, who he healed them all and one of them realized he'd been healed and only one came back and thanked Jesus. And that's all. So, those are my ponderings today. Other um, thoughts or um, input that you'd like to share? Because we have about maybe three minutes. I do want y'all to remember that next week, um, Rusty is going to be leading our time together. Read your chapters, see what strikes you, but I love his two questions. Which one are you? And what is your story? What difference does it make? I think I read about that in this week's um, update. How to study the Bible, the, the questions, who, what, where, why, when, and so what. That's the kind of point of life. What difference? Anybody else? Because I was about to ask David to close us in prayer. He's a good prayer. Have y'all ever heard him pray? I haven't either, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell he has a prayerful heart. So you, would you do that? Okay, come talk to him. Let's bow our heads, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, as always, for this time together and this fellowship and for the lessons we have heard tonight. Uh, help us to take what we have learned and spread it throughout the community. In thy name we pray. Amen.